September is preparing us for the coming winter. The turn of the year 41 to 42 was already bitterly cold. Therefore, I wished that this winter we'd also receive some decent quarters. But for now I'm hoping for home leave so that I can finally lead Gudrun to the altar. I've asked our platoon leader some time ago already for a week of leave from the front. He wasn't sure whether that would work out. We have no more personnel. The Russian is pressing everywhere. Every man is needed. But he promised to take care of it. Maybe I've actually earned the leave. Our Panther 3 is sitting with the repair unit and my crew it actually isn't my crew, but I'm acting as commander, was assigned to other vehicles and is deployed against the enemy. I could have gotten in again as tank gunner, but it was said in our unit that the commanders without tanks were being held as a last reserve. In the workshop, I took a look at the repairs and found that the platoon here have equipped themselves well. Old machine shops with proper cranes were taken over. That makes the repair work easier. The turret is supposed to be swapped out soon, but apparently the engine has issues and first has to go into overhaul again. I catch myself again and again standing by the long barreled Panzer IV and looking at the mighty main gun. The caliber with a barrel length of more than 3 meters. That really makes a strong impression on the Russian tanks. With that, one can engage at a distance. On the other hand, the gun of the T-34 with its 76 mm isn't too bad either. Out of all operations, one can state that the Russian tank crews are really not trained well. They drive on wildly and shoot at everything that moves. They typically roll over anything that gets under the tracks and keep driving until either the fuel or the ammunition is gone. There one can recognize any organized order of attack or coordinated focal points as a spearhead in a frontline sector. They just drive forward and when it fails another tank will follow right behind. I spent my time in the workshop or with a staff unit and snap up bits of information here and there. Hopefully my boys will make it back unscathed. After two days I am to go to the Sarge. I hurry up and get going. In the staff office I have to wait a bit longer since they are currently busy working on the casualty lists and all letters home also have to be worded accordingly. After a while the Sarge gets me and explains to me that the company commander approved 10 days of full log for me. I am happy as a clown and get packing right away. I know that it will take at least 3 days until I am home and 3 days back. Quickly, I have a telegram sent home that I'll be home in three days and will be able to get married while on leave. After I gathered all my stuff, I say goodbye to the comrades who aren't deployed against the enemy at the moment. I organize a ride to the next train station. First it will go in the direction of Charkiv again and from there home to the Reich. In Modstock, I managed to catch a supply truck which takes me almost 80 kilometers to the next traffic hub. Then another 40 kilometers and at the train station I make it into a train to Charkiv. Over several other stations the long journey goes and I am in a good spirit that I will make it to the homeland quickly. I have time to reflect on the last months once again. Much has happened. And I sometimes wonder whether I'd supposed to go like this forever. When will this war be over and when will we be back home? Home. A normal life at home with a family. To work in a normal job which assures one existence. Also going on vacation. To start a family 
and go to church on Sundays. That would be great. Well, it will eventually come that way when we have wrestled down the Russian bear. Day and night I spent on the rail tracks on the way home. After three days I actually arrive at home. At the train station my parents and friends are already waiting for me and Gudrun as well. Again in my black tanker uniform I am of course a visual attraction for the Hitler youth who are literally bombarding me with a thousand questions. Finally I've greeted everyone and I am able to hold my Gudrun in my arms for a long time. How I've missed that, the warmth of her body, the perfume, the scan of the hair. I am blown away. Joyfully, my mother tells me how happy she is and that the wedding party is already complete. We are getting married in two days at the village church. The celebration has also already been organized. This is like the camaraderie at the front. It's taken care of. I need not worry a whole lot. Everything will go its way. A little money I had saved for the wedding, but my father and future father-in-law want to take care of all financial matters. In return, they would like to see grandkids soon. Well, in that matter, I won't disappoint them. For a long time, we are sitting together with the family. The one or the other bottle of wine is passed over the table. There are so many questions. How are we standing in the East? How is the war going? What success is the glorious tank force celebrating? But a few acquaintances are also present who tell who all had already fallen. I don't want to say anything to that because I see death daily in front of my optic or out of my hatch. Death is omnipresent. Dying is part of it. Of course, that's a different topic at home. Here, one only sees the death notice of the comrades with a picture and which unit they belong to. But also that highly decorated man had fallen. It's always a tragedy. I'm glad to still be almost in one piece. But even with them schnapps, I'm not letting myself be pulled into telling the truth about the front. Late at night, it's finally going to bed. Despite of the hardships, I'm feeling great and inner peace overcomes me. I'm not hearing the thunder of cannon, no airplanes or tank guns that go bang. I am home. Gudrun in her parents' house has a small living quarter to herself and I am allowed to spend the night with my fiancé. After a wonderful night, the day starts off right away with wedding preparations. My uniform is going to the dry cleaner, the boots are polished to spit shine by the neighbor boys. I've got some time to myself. So I go visit my sister Hilde in the neighboring town. She did show up at my welcoming, but only briefly. Her husband, my brother-in-law Willibald, has fallen two weeks ago. Therefore, I wanted to lend her some comfort. He was with the paratroopers and in action in Holland and Crete. He was a hell of a guy and a real daredevil. After all we know, he must have been in Africa at last. There are bomb attacks cost him his life. Now I am sitting with my sister, who is no longer the same. The pain of her grief is taking a heavy toll on her. I believe it will take a long time before she will be able to smile again. Many dear people are torn out of their families and give their life for the fatherland, all in the hope to protect the loved ones at home that way. But that won't bring her Willibald back. We talk much for a long time about the past and the joy that Willibald always brought us with his jokes. Then I can finally convince her to attend the wedding tomorrow. 
In the evening there is also a small bachelor party, which does not turn out as a booze happy as planned. I don't want to have to give my yes I do to Gudrun with a thick hat. So early in the evening the merry farewell is ended and I am on my way to Gudrun. She rarely asks about my experiences at the front. She knows that I will tell something when I'm ready to. But there is no room for all that here now. I want to enjoy the short time at home. The next morning Gudrun vanishes to get into her wedding dress. My uniform has been spiffed up, so I arrive at my parents' house all groomed and dressed up. Now follows a serious conversation with my father. He wants to give me some good advice along the way. Always be the man in the house, don't show any weakness, children are a woman's job, the family goes beyond all, and several other things he advises me. My father, as a veteran of the World War, has his own view of things. I respect that. But I think I will find my way. Nevertheless, I thank for the fatherly advice and see his eyes full of pride when he first looks at my medals, then my uniform and then myself. As a farewell, he places his hand on my shoulder and states me he was proud of his son. I'm touched to hear that and also happy about what he says to me. Then I have to go to my mother, who certainly also wants to give me some warm words to take along. I'm sitting with her in her sewing room. We're drinking coffee. For a long time she says nothing and only looks at me. Then she asks me how I am doing. I smile back and say I'm doing fine and would be happy to be a husband soon. She doesn't smile. A long pause sets in, which is making me uncomfortable. Now she asks me once more how I was doing. Now I realize what she means, how it's going inside my soul after all I've witnessed and done. She scoots close to me, takes my hand into hers and holds me tight. We are silent. My mother looks at me and I know that she's seeing inside my head. I can't pretend anything to her. She knows it. She knows that I'm torn up inside and my bloody body is actually scattered in a thousand shreds over the Russian soil. She knows that I've become numb and have killed so many enemies that it would suffice for a hundred lives. She sees the pain which I'd felt with every fallen comrade at the front. All that she sees in my eyes and then I can't hold myself back anymore. Tears run down my cheeks. My mother takes me in the arms and holds me tight. As tight as the little boy whom she'd carried in her arms when he'd fallen down. I cry and cry, speak of names and occasions where bad things had happened. Terrible things that are all coming up inside me now. Like out of a large steel chest that you open, do all the feelings spill out of me. All the months at the front, I've swallowed it up inside of me. There was no chance to let it out, but now it's out. Slowly, I'm catching my composure and let go of my mother. She takes a handkerchief and dries my tears. That was good, she says. Now you can go and marry your good woman. Be a good husband and always return home. These words she gives me along the way and releases me into the hands of another woman who is now supposed to stand by my side. I walk out through the back door to be alone for a bit longer. I sit down on the old bench in the garden and stare up into the sky. All is well, all will be well. It's time. The church is waiting, Gudrun is waiting, 
just the war. It still has to wait.